Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our study of Paul's second letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, uh, we're in chapter 3. We've been in chapter 3 for a couple of weeks now, actually. Well, because there's so much meat in that that we have to really look at. It's incredible. So we're going to be starting again, and we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 13. Mm -hmm. But before I do that, Alice is going to ask for God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we bless your holy name. We thank you for the understanding, understanding that you give us. And Lord, we just ask that we can share what we learn with others and mm -hmm. that we would live our lives to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, as I said, we've been in this, for this chapter for a couple of weeks now. Second Timothy chapter 3. And basically, last, last two weeks, we looked at just this, lovers of self and lovers of money. And uh, there's a reason for bringing those two together, because they're interconnected. And as you're going to see, I think everything here is interconnected. Yes. But I want to start today by reading this chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Okay? You can't hear it enough. No, you can't. And I, I, it's, because I want to kind of do a summary of some of these things, right? right? So Paul says to Timothy, But realize this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected as regards the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. But you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted." But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Amen. Well, that's a mouthful. But I, I do want to take a look at this, and I want to take a look at it little by little, because it's so important. I mean, this, these are the things that we're going to encounter in the perilous last days, and I believe that we are in those perilous de last days. Absolutely. This is such a description of today. Well, it, it certainly is. Yeah. It certainly is. So, as I said, in the past two studies, I've made a point of showing the connection between lovers of self and lovers of money. And the reason was, and is, for us to understand that like the fruit of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. which is all interconnected, right? Yes. It's bonded together in the life of a believer, so these characteristics of sinfulness are entwined together, Right? The first will lead to the second, and then right on down the line, okay? So we need to understand them and guard against them in our lives and in the life of the true church. For these characteristics in, these, in this chapter provide the very definition of the false church. So, let's make sure we understand each. Following lovers of self and lovers of money, Paul states that the next item is boastful. The King James, I'm reading the New American Standard, by the way. The King James says boasters, right? Same thing. The dictionary says that boasting is to speak with exaggeration and excess, exaggeration 
and excessive pride, especially about oneself. Mm -hmm. Right? You're boasting in yourself. Mm -hmm. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to, 30, to 31. So, yeah, we, we need to be boasting. Mm -hmm. But we need to be boasting in the Lord. You know, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 17 through 18. He said, but he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Remember that Paul had written this a little bit earlier, um, here in his letter to Timothy, that Timothy was to show himself approved unto God, a workman. Not to others, not to himself. And Paul lived and what he preached. He practiced what he preached, right? Yes, he did. In Galatians 6.14, listen to what he said. But may it never be that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You want to boast? Boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. And where was that? That's in Galatians 6, 14. You have talents and skills. You do. Because that's the Lord equipping you for the work that he's called you to. He never calls you to anything that he doesn't equip you for. So whatever he's called you for, whatever it may be, he has given you the talents and skills that you need to accomplish it. So when you do the work that he's called you to, remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. So yeah, what you do is supposed to bring glory to God, not glory to you. If you get the credit, if you get the glory, you've robbed God. He said, I, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Whatever skill or talent that you have, never forget. Again, I'm going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, where Paul wrote, For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Listen, I, you know, I've been preaching the word, teaching the word for over 40 years, 40, 42 years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, because our ministry has taken us many, many places in the world. And, and I may preach and somebody will say, well, that was really great. Well, I said, I plagiarize everything. <laughs> I plagiarize everything. I'm not ashamed of that. You know, if, if what I'm saying, Jesus or Paul or Peter hasn't said before me, I better be on guard. <laughs> I better be on guard. I'm not trying to boast in myself. I'm not trying to show you something new. I mean, I, I pray that through these studies you can gain some understanding. Right. But there's nothing new. But there's nothing new. Right. Nothing new under the sun, the Word says. Right. So what I get, I've gotten from God. I get from the Holy Spirit because it was the Holy Spirit that was sent to lead us into all truth. Be careful you don't boast in you know what you know. Right. Because that's what it says. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Love builds up. Right. All right, the next one is arrogant. Arrogance. Now, the King James there translates that as proud. There's a, there's a difference, a, a little difference between proud and pride and, and arrogance. Because you can be arrogant in, I mean, truth. I mean, you know well, something and, and you, no, you can back down. You can appear arrogant. Right. You can okay. appear, right. I, I believe, well, let me just give you the dictionary definition again. Mm -hmm. It's a sense of superiority, mm -hmm. of self-importance, or entitlement. That's what arrogance is. Yeah. And I believe with all my heart that Paul would have appeared to many, many people as being arrogant. Yes. And the reason he would have appeared that way is because 
He wasn't open-minded. No. He knew what he knew, mm-hmm. and he knew in whom he believed. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't gonna, you know, he wasn't gonna be open to let's sit down and see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I'm not gonna be open-minded about no. this. No. There's no. only one way. So. so I think, you know, I mean, if, if a Buddhist came up to me and said, "Well, you know, maybe, maybe you're wrong, maybe I'm right," I'm gonna say, you know what? I know in whom I have believed. That's right. And if that appears arrogant to him, it's not. I'm not trying to appear arrogant. No. I'm trying to. I'm trying to con- confess the simple fact that I believe what I believe. Mm-hmm. We we saw something the other day or the other morning, and it was about you know searching for proof of the afterlife. Proof of the afterlife. I talk to him every day. I don't. You know. I don't. All of the scientific study in the world. All of the medical study. About life after death. I know that there is life after death because I talk to somebody who is risen from the dead every single day. Oh, now, that makes, yeah, so that makes me look arrogant. I can't help that. But I pray that people will see the truth of what I'm saying, okay? A lover of self is focused on himself or herself, and the pride becomes arrogant when he or she looks at self as when they see self importance. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then the big lie, if you become self-important, the big lie will find entrance into your heart. You think you're important because of you. Mm. Now, you are incredibly important, but only because of the work of God in you and for you. Jesus made a statement and followed with a question in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Matthew 6, 26. I've done a lot of studies on that. I mean, that's a question. When Jesus asks you a question, that demands an answer. Have you considered this? Are you not worth more? Yes. How do you determine the worth of something? I'm telling you very simply, because I'm not going to go into a whole study on this here, but the worth of something, the value of something is determined on what people will pay. Somebody will pay for it. Exactly. Okay? How much is your car worth? It's worth what somebody will pay you. Mm -hmm. Well, you were purchased with a price. God the Father purchased you, and he was willing, he paid Jesus Christ for you. How much are you worth? You are worth Jesus Christ. That's the truth. That's the magnificent truth. That's the truth that should excite you and send tingles through your spirit. But if you start to believe in in self-esteem, that you're valuable because of who you are, what you've done, you'll, you'll lose this truth, I'm telling you. Your value must not be based on what you think of yourself. Self-esteem. Self-esteem is a monstrous heresy traveling through this country. I'll tell you what. It's not about what you esteem yourself. It's about how God esteems you. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. If you don't know that, your bubble's going to burst. And you'll find out with David. If you think you're so important, you'll find out with David, the king of Israel, and a man at the God's own heart discovered in the natural. He said, but I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Psalm 22.6. Because that's what you are in the natural without the touch of God, without the Holy Spirit at work in you. Well, think about this. This is one of the most arrogant men that ever lived. Okay? I'm going to read from Daniel 4, verses 28 through 33. Okay. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field, You'll be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind 
and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. One of the most powerful men that ever lived on the face of the earth. And because of his arrogance, his arrogant pride, God turned him into, made him like an animal. Let me tell you something. The high, I want to, you, you know, the purpose of this is to encourage you and get you to the place where you can walk in the fullness of God's calling, right? The highest title that you can have is this. Not apostle, mm -hmm. not the bishop, yeah. not the high, most muckety-muck leader of pastor, not the prophet. You know what the highest calling, what the best title you can have is? For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans eight fourteen to 16 What better thing could you be called than a child of God? Nothing. 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 But it doesn't, you know, if you're looking for that title, it gives you, I've got a plaque in on my desk, which was done oh, I bring that out. when we do, when we did seminars. And I did this to show um, the, the falsehood of, yes. of what man's nature is. It's a really nice wooden plaque. Um, and Alice had it made for me. It, it only has initials because the title, my title was too long. To have it all. The title, my title was Chief Executive Muckety Muck in Charge of Almost Everything. Mm -hmm. Because in the natural, that's what you want to be. But you know what? Humble yourself in the sight of God, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. All right, the next one is revilers. The King James says blasphemers. Now, revile means to speak evil, to slander, to abuse, to speak irreverently of God or sacred things. Okay? It's not always against God, okay? Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 4.29. That's it. Let no unwholesome word. Don't revile. Don't speak evil of people. And it, it, Paul continues on two verses later to say, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's all in Ephesians chapter 4. right? Now slander in the New American Standard Bible and evil speaking in the King James in that verse are the same Greek word that's translated as revile and blaspheme in 2 Timothy 3.2, while we usually associate it with speaking against God. It's also used a number of times in Scripture regarding speaking against or reviling godly people. Right? Now, Solomon, writing of how a wise son makes his father glad, and a foolish son is a grief to his mother, Proverbs 10.1 says that, he put it this way, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, Proverbs 10, 11. My mother and father put it, in, uh, put it this way, craning me when I was a child. If you don't have anything good to say about any, somebody, don't say anything. Yes. We've heard that so many times when we were well, growing up. When we were growing up. Yeah. Which brings us to the next item, being disobedient to parents. Oh, boy. Uh -huh. So, I'm not going to go to the dictionary on this one, because you already know yes. what, what disobedience to parents means. But let's look at these verses, all right? In Ephesians, Ephesians 6, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Mm. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. 
The breakdown of family life in the United States is astounding. In 2014, which was the most recent one I could find, a Pew Research study uh, that's surely outdated by now, since the trend is so obviously downward, reported that when I graduated high school in 1960-61, right? Here's what the Pew said. Uh, While in the early 1960s, babies typically arrived within a marriage, today, for fully 40% of births occur to women who are single or living with a non-marital partner. How can that happen in such a short time? And I'll, I'll tell you, listen, we speak the truth in love. In black households today, only about 20% of children are born into a two-parent setting with no divorces. 20%. 20%. The number of children who are growing up without a true father figure is literally astounding. Even when there may be a man in the picture, he'll often be too busy to spend time with his offspring, right? And it's almost certain that those children will not be brought up with a father fulfilling the foremost command. What's the foremost command? These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. Train them up in the ways of the Lord all the time as they grow. So it's no wonder, if that's not being done, that before the Lord returns, before that great and terrible day of the Lord, God says in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. I mean, this is, that's, this is, just, this is the end times. This is end time stuff. Absolutely. You see the breakdowns of families. Now, the core of the church is the family. Yes, that's okay. okay. The first church, you know, I'm not going to get into a debate about this, but the first church, it didn't start on the day of Pentecost. No, it did not. The first church was when Adam and the woman were in the garden with God. The first family. Because church is nothing more than believers gathered in the presence of the Lord. That's what church is. Mm-hmm. If you don't, don't agree with that, write to Jesus at heaven.org. Okay. Husband and wife join together in the Lord. That's church. Then parents and children with the Lord. That's church. Mm -hmm. Then believing families join together in the Lord. That's church. You ever hear the expression rotten to the core? Yes. Now that's an idiom that dates back to around 1800. And the word core means a central part of something. Mm -hmm. The church, the central part, the core of the church is family life. Why do you think Satan is so intent on attacking and destroying family life. And if you can't see that, you are not paying attention. Okay. Fathers, fulfill your ministry. That's what Paul spoke to Timothy. Fulfill your ministry. Because you will answer to God for it. I promise you that. Everybody else, please remember that disobedience to godly authority is rebellion. And rebellion is as witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, 23. Don't practice witchcraft. Ungrateful is the next one. King James says unthankful. That means unappreciative, not displaying gratitude, not giving due return or recompense for benefits conferred. That's what the dictionary says, right? As Alice and I travel and minister, it's common for a lot of brothers and sisters uh, in the Lord to say to me, God bless you. And, and I know that they're often, I mean, they're actually... Asking God's blessing yes, on me. Yeah. But my response has become almost automatic mm-hmm. as my understanding continues to grow because I'll always say, He does. And far more than I deserve. Far more than I deserve. He does. Mm-hmm. But it is more than I deserve because the foundational truth of our faith is that God our Father, Abba, blessed us and continues, goes on blessing us based on what Jesus deserves and what He did. 
I'm often very, very thankful that I don't get what I deserve. It's amazing grace. But I've learned to give thanks regardless of what the circumstances are, because I have been trained in righteousness by the word. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 through 18. Give thanks in everything. But beyond that, that's not enough. Paul also wrote to the Ephesians and said, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Ephesians 5.20. Not just in everything, but for everything. Not just in all things, but for all things. And you know, that should be very easy to us. Mm -hmm. Because God's word, which can't be broken, says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who call according to his purpose. Romans 8.28. So if you know it's going to work for your good, why can't you give thanks? Maybe it's an issue of faith. Maybe you don't believe. Maybe you're not trusting in God. Maybe it's a like a, a, a one of those warning lights on the dashboard of your car. That if you if you're not giving thanks, that red light should be flashing and let you know there's a problem. An an engine warning light or something. What we call that in the United States is an idiot light. An idiot light. You don't want God to you say to you, hey, you're being an idiot. Give him thanks. Praise him. Give him thanks. And then the next one is that I'll try and get this in is unholy, right? Mm -hmm. Holy in the life of a believer means to be separated, set apart for God, set apart for his use. Just like the apostle Paul who said, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. We are all set apart by the Lord, our God, our maker. You, I'm sure you've heard this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or, or a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, nine. Set apart so that every believer has purpose, that calling, right? It doesn't require Bible college, seminary, or ordination for you to do this, to proclaim his excellencies. It just requires obedience. It's not the ministry that you have chosen. It's what you were called and set apart for. It's about being holy. Because the only other choice is to be unholy, right? If anything keeps you from it, you're being unholy. That would be being <clears throat> part of the world. Absolutely. Because, absolutely. Because we're supposed to be yeah. we come out and be separate. Because it's about the glory of God, proclaiming yes. his excellencies. In, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul mm -hmm. wrote, For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body so that you may proclaim his excellencies. Isn't that what it said? Yes. Therefore, glorify God. Therefore is what you're there for. And it's, really, right. and as Paul will say to Timothy, just ahead in the next chapter, fulfill your ministry. Second Timothy 4, 5. And Father, that's my prayer, that we would fulfill the ministry that you have called us to, to be ambassadors for you, Lord God to be ministers of reconciliation, to be faithful witnesses of your love, to bring the knowledge of you into every place that we go, Lord God. Help us to be faithful in doing that. You said that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Lord, help us to act boldly and proclaim your wonderful, glorious name. And I just ask that, Father, in the precious name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Well, we run out of time again. So until next week, when we'll continue on with this study in 2 Timothy chapter 3, pray for us. You can write to us. We have a great prayer line if you need prayer. Call us at BibleTalk.com or prayer at BibleTalk.com. And we'd love to hear from you. I pray that the words that we speak will go into all of our hearts and spirits, Lord, and just move us and shake us in Jesus' name. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye.
of your mighty love.